Thank you very much. So I'm going to start my talk actually from space, and not just close to the Earth in space, but actually four billion miles away from the Earth in space. And this particular image that I'm showing you was taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft looking back at the Earth. Although it's a, a very coarse resolution image, I'm starting with it because I think it's amazing to think that we have these images. The, and it's called the blue dot because as you can see, and you should be able to see it up there, the Earth looks like a blue dot four million miles away. And, and so this is my, my starting point. But most of the data I deal with is actually from much closer to the Earth. And so we're now going to very much zoom in to the type of images I look at every day. And I have to say I'm very privileged to look at these images because I think they're absolutely stunning. And this couple of images I'm showing you now are from a series called the Blue Marble. And the most recent images are collected from a satellite called Vios that is orbiting just above the Earth. And as the Earth rotates, Vios comes around in a polar orbit. And so it's taking scans of imagery. And what NASA have done in these particular examples is stitched all those images together to create you a, a full global view. And this view is at one kilometer resolution, which is why you can see so much detail in it. And they're pretty big to download from the internet, I have to say, but they're all freely available and out there. So you can go on NASA's website and pick, pick these up. And what you can see from these images is what we, we sort of expect from, from the blue marble view. And we see the clouds in white, we see the oceans in blue, and we see the land in a mixture of brown and green, depending on how much vegetation is growing and is active. And you might also see some vertical stripes on these images, and that's actually sun glint. So that's where the sun is hitting the surface of the ocean and bouncing off. So I'm going to start now with the participants' questions, and we'll see how this works. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you what you think you can see from space. So I'm going to take the example of a satellite called Sentinel-2. And this is from a recent set of satellites um, that are uh, European satellites and have, have been launched over the last few years. It's at an altitude of almost 800 kilometers. And it has a pixel size of 15 meters. And so what do you think you could see from that? Could you see the Great Wall of China? Could you see a house? Could you see anything that's bigger than that pixel size? Or does it not actually matter what size the object is as to whether you can see it? So this is, I think, where you should now all be using your mobile phones um, and um, giving me some sort of poll approach. <laughs> oh, I'm seeing them coming in. That's good. So I think. The audience has got the answer right. <laughs> I, I go thing. So the answer is you can see all these things from space, and it really depends on the, the, the pixel resolution. But actually, it also doesn't, because what, I, what I'm going to spend most of this talk uh, talking about is plankton, and actually they're microscopic, and we can see them from space, which I think is an amazing thing. So I'm going to carry on now. So what I'm doing now is I'm unfurling my globe. So if you think of your globe, it's this 3D structure. But to see a map, what we need is it's like peeling an orange. You need to take the peel off and flatten it so that you can lay it flat on the table. And traditionally, this is how we've looked at imagery, although, although it is changing to more 3D views. And that's because we, we tended to have in the past flat t these screens or flat maps. And this is in a, a particular projection called a Mercator map projection. And it has artifacts within it because we've unfurled that 3D structure and put it flat. And so your countries like Africa appear much smaller in proportion to countries further north or south. So often you compare Africa and Greenland, which you, you don't get a true representation of on on this particular map projection. 
But it's a, it's a nice way to start because what I'm going to do next is I'm now going to peel the atmosphere away. And the reason why the ocean looks blue is primarily the atmosphere. 90% of the signal is actually coming from scattering in the atmosphere rather than the signal from the oceans itself. And so when I start to peel that, that atmosphere away, what we start to see is the colour of the ocean. And I'm taking the land away as well because that's relatively bright compared to the ocean. And you can now see shades of colour. So in the deep ocean, which we call the ocean gyres, you're seeing the blue. But to the north and south, you're seeing this green coloration. And this is our, our phytoplankton, our microscopic plants living in the ocean. And this is a colour composite. So we're, we're using bands that approximately red, green, and blue to show you what it would be like to have something like a colour photo taken from space. What I'm next going to change to is a, a chlorophyll map. So what, what we do with that is we actually then apply some mathematics and we calculate the concentration of the, the green pigment, the chlorophyll, in the plankton. And then we can show that as a map. And I'm going to show you the annual time series. And so this is going to run as a slow animation so you can see it changing. What I will point out at the start is you'll see the northern and southern extents moving. And this is because we're moving through the season. So as you move into the winter in the northern hemisphere, it gets darker earlier in the day, and so the satellite can see less imagery when it, when it goes over. There's not so much light for it to get a signal back from. While in the southern hemisphere, you'll, you'll be getting brighter. But as we move from the winter, and we're now in December, so we're, we're the, through the spring, then you'll start to see the green increase. And this is the spring blue. So the, the plankton in the ocean are like the plants on Earth. As the light starts to increase in the spring, they start growing and multiplying and blooming. And you get more activity uh, going on in the oceans. And so we've stopped on April. And so you can see, if you look between the UK and America, you can see it's quite green. And this is our, our North Atlantic spring bloom in action. If I start to, to zoom in, then we can see a bit closer what's going on around the UK and the coastline. And what you should be able to see is that around the coast, we're also greener than we are in the open ocean. And this is, again, because we tend to get an upwelling of nutrients at the coastline. And particularly um, near the UK, you'll see this strong line around the UK, and that is called the continental shelf. And that's where we go from the deep ocean to the much shallower ocean, and the plankton particularly like to, to live there because there's a lot of upwelling and turbulence in the water. And what you're seeing over Africa is not some strange artefact, <laughs> but is actually a plankton. So this is a phytoplankton seen under a microscope. So what I'm showing you here is these two views. You've got the view of the phytoplankton 800 kilometers away in space, and in parallel, you've got the, the view of the plankton under a microscope, what it looks like. And I think both look wonderful and show you just how amazing these creatures are. And they're really important for life on Earth. So a third of known species live in the ocean, and these phytoplankton are the basis of that food chain. So the um, plants, the phytoplankton, are eaten by the animals, the zooplankton, who in turn would be eaten by the fish, and then by us and, and other animals. Also, because they're plants, they take in carbon dioxide. And so a third of the carbon dioxide is also taken up by the ocean and then put back out as oxygen. So they're controlling the amount of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the atmosphere as well. And as the amount of carbon dioxide increases, you can also get problems in the ocean because it becomes more acidic due to the, uh, the absorption of uh, carbon dioxide. So this is a, a really important ecosystem that we often don't know about because if we're, we're on a boat, we just see this, this blue ocean. 
And so I, I'm now going to zoom in a bit further and start to look at some further detail. So, so far I've been using global imagery and they are also composite, so I'm taking 10 years of data and adding it together so you didn't see any clouds. But we also have much higher resolution imagery and this is from the satellite Sentinel-2. So whereas before the data I was showing you was at four kilometer pixel size, so four by four kilometer for each point, this is now 15 meter pixel size. And what you can see, again, I've, I've stripped away the atmosphere, is that again, we can see the wonder of what's going on within the ocean. So I very much had to saturate the land because it's very much brighter, so you can see this. But you can now see this wonderful combination of physics and biology creating these amazing patterns. And this is just off Scotland, the Outer Hebrides. This is where this is occurring. You might also see some, some artifacts in the imagery as well. And that's because Sentinel-2 is not really designed for looking at the oceans. It, it's more designed for looking at the land. So there are some diagonal stripes like this, which is effect of the, the scanner. And you might also see some lines like this. Um, and if you look carefully, you'll see some white lines. And it, if you're very careful, and if it shows up well on this screen, you might see a shadow. And that's contrails in the atmosphere. So I, I've not managed to move everything of the atmosphere here, because if we have a cloud, we actually can't see underneath it. So we're, we're going to zoom back out again, because I, I don't want to only show you optical data, but I also want to show you another, another form of remote sensing. And this is an image from the, the Sentinel-1 satellite. And so this is a, a sister satellite, you could call it, to Sentinel-2. They're all, all part of a, a European program called Copernicus. And the Sentinel-1 satellite is also of a similar spatial resolution, 20 meters. So we're looking now at the Dutch coast, and you can see the land because, again, it's very much brighter, and you can see fields and um, other infrastructure on the land. But hopefully, you should also be able to see things going on in the ocean as well. And so up above my head, if you look very carefully, you will see some clusters of very small, quite faint dots. And they're actually two sets of wind farms. And you can actually really zoom in on this imagery and start to almost see the, the blades on those wind farms. And the bigger dots going across the screen are boats, so vessels at sea. So what, what the satellite imagery allows us to do is not only look at the, the plankton, which are the basis of the food chain, but also to look at human activities as well, the blue economy. We can see what's going on on the surface of the ocean. And one of the, the impressive things about microwave data is it sees through clouds. So for this data, we can look at any weather conditions uh, because we're, we're not blocked by our clouds. So this is a wonderful resource, but I have to say we can't use it on its own. We can't say we only do satellite remote sensing. You also have to do modeling and measurements from boats as well. And so for my example of ground-based measurements, I'm going to show you a, a citizen science program. And this is the, the Seki disk project that has been running since 2003. And the Seki disk is a white disk that's lowered into the ocean until it disappears. And you just measure how deep that, that measurement is. And then that tells you how turbid the water is. And by doing that, we start to get a view also from the ground about what's happening in the ocean. And then I'm going to finish off with something that's very much in the news at the minute, and that's microplastics. Because I'm sure many of you don't own boats and are not going to go out into the ocean and take measurements. But we all have an impact on the ocean, whether it is positive or negative. And this is very much something where we're all putting plastics into the ocean, either because we're, we're using um, makeup or other things that contain the little balls that go down the sink and out the sewers, or we're leaving rubbish on the beach, and that's ending up in the ocean and ultimately being eaten by fish and other animals. 
and potentially coming back to us as well as the, as the food we eat. So alongside seeing the ocean as a wonderful thing, we also have to look after it, and that, that's a responsibility of everyone. So I'd like to thank you very much um, for, for listening to this, and, and I hope you very much enjoyed the presentation. <laughs>